Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. All right, Shabbat Shalom. We've been in a long series on uh, Eliyahu, Elijah, and, and Elisha, Elisha, Elisha. Uh, today we're going to finish the story of Naaman that we started last week from 2 Kings chapter 5. So turn with me, if you will. We have it on the overhead as well. 2 Kings 5, we're going to read two, verses 2 and 3, and then jump down and read the, the rest of the chapter from last week, verses 15 to 27. And there'll be some overlap, obviously. Uh, so 2 Kings 5, verse 2. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. And let's drop down now to verse 15. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you won't, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Ramon to bow down, and he's leaning on my arm, and I have to bow down there also, when I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha said. After Naaman had, tra- after Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, my master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I'll run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running towards him, he got down off his chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? He asked. Everything's all right, Gehazi answered. Uh, My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and and, uh, tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them the two of his servants, and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent them in away, and they left. When he went in and stood before his master, Elisha, uh, when he stood before his master, Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere. Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to accept money or take clothes? Or olive groves and vineyards? Or flocks and herds? Or male and female slaves? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. And Gehazi went from there, went from Elisha's presence, and his skin was leprous. It had become white as snow. Last week, we began to look at the story of Naaman. And I encourage you, if you didn't hear it last week, to go on YouTube and, and check it out. And we saw how the Lord cured Naaman of his leprosy uh, through Elisha, the prophet. And we saw last week, uh, Naaman goes, seeks the God of the Bible, finds him, and he's born again. He becomes a believer in and a follower of the one true God. And last week, we looked at why he began to be a seeker uh, and how he met the Lord and was converted. And in order to do part two today, we need to briefly recap a part one from last week. Last week, looking at 2 Kings 5, the first 19 verses of 2 Kings 5, we saw there were, there were two parts to that story uh, and two main points. In the first part, we saw that Naaman was the supreme military commander of the armies of Aram, which is modern-day Syria. He was wealthy, popular, successful, valiant. But despite having everything the world can give you, he had leprosy, this wasting disease. He was literally falling apart. And so even though he had everything the world could give, the world could not help him. 
And so he ends up going to Israel to seek his cure from the God of Israel. And that was the first part uh, and the first point from last week. And we'll put this on the overhead. Indeed, one of the main points of the whole Bible is you and I are conditioned to believe that if we have some problem, uh, uh, that the problem comes from someone or some circumstance out there. And that the solution to our problem, you can find deep inside. In fact, most modern movies have this theme. You have a problem, but you can do it. You have all that it takes inside. You have to look inside of yourself. You have to reach down deep within. And you have everything it takes to face and overcome your problems. On the overhead. But the Bible says it's exactly the opposite. The problems are not from out there. And the solutions are not from in here. No. Your biggest problems are from within you. Your biggest problems uh, are your sinful Selfish heart, your pride, your fallen, unregenerate spirit, and the overhead. And the only solution is for you to go outside of yourself to Yeshua the Messiah, to get the spiritual rebirth and intervention and salvation and transformation of God. And unless you make this switch from wrongly thinking my problems are outside and my solution is within, to rightly realizing my problems are within, The problem with the world is me, and the solution is from without, outside of myself, in the Lord, unless and until you come to that realization, you cannot be redeemed or rescued and set free and be generated into a new creation in Messiah Yeshua. Until you come to this this paradigm shift, you cannot meet God. Now, the second part of our passage from last week, Naaman, he goes to Israel, he takes with him this letter from his king and a ton of money uh, and a readiness to do a great deed. Because he expected that he had to purchase his cure from God or, or, or win it by some great deed uh, to earn it, to merit it. But when the, he gets to, gets to the prophet Elisha, he was told that if you want to be cured, all you have to do is go down to the Jordan River and wash seven times and you'll be cured. And Naaman is furious. He won't even go and do it at first. But then he finally goes. He's furious because he says, has this God no standards? I'm ready to earn. I'm ready to buy. I'm a man of resources. I'm a man of morality. I'm a man of character. I'm a man of ability. And I'm ready to earn my cure. Or just to go down to the Jordan and wash well, 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 anybody could do that. Has this God no standards? You know, according, according to this reasoning, the prostitute and the priest would be on the same level. The good person and the bad person would be on the same level. And what's so brilliant about what Elisha asked him to do is the only way he can get his cure for his body is to have a, re- a, re- is to have a revolution in the way that he thinks. His whole worldview has to change because he has to learn that this God, the God of Israel, only gives salvation by free grace. And that no one can merit it. No one could possibly earn it. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. So Naaman has to learn this, that he must come to God as a humble sinner, seeking God's grace. God's grace. And when he does, he not only gets the cure for his body, but for his soul as well. He's regenerated and reborn spiritually as well. On the overhead, the only way to become a Yeshua follower is this. All you need is need. All you need is nothing. But most of us don't have it. Naaman comes saying, I've got lots to offer, uh, lots that I can do. Surely God will now save me. But he has to learn he has nothing. He has to come with nothing. He has to say, I'm no different from the prostitute. I must be saved by grace. You need nothing. But most of us don't have it. And only when Naaman comes with nothing, then then he gets not only his cure, but also a radical spiritual transformation and rebirth from within. He meets the Lord. He's redeemed. He's delivered. 
So let me ask you today, have you met God? Have you really met him? And if you say, well, I'm listening to this, this drash, aren't I? I go to shul, I read my Bible, I pray, I believe in God, I follow the Ten Commandments, I observe Shabbat and the holy days, I'm religious. Yes, and that's what the second half of this story is all about. Because Naaman, who was a pagan, and knew nothing about the God of the Bible, he, he had no biblical background, he's born again. He gets a changed heart. But Gehazi, who lives with the prophet, Elisha, who's like the apprentice to the prophet, uh, who lives at the heart of Israel's biblical religion, probably knew the Bible inside and out, put this on the overhead, he doesn't have a changed heart. Naaman, with no religious background, meets God. Gehazi, with extensive religious background, misses God. So how do you know you're not missing God? Have you met him? That's what we're going to look at today. So we're going to look at these three things. Uh, number one, the marks of a man who's met God. That's Naaman. Number two, the marks of a man who, in spite of all his religious background, misses God, Gehazi. And number three, how can you be sure to meet and not to miss God? So first, what are the marks of someone who's had a real encounter with the living God? You see this uh, in 2 Kings uh, uh, 5, verses 15 to 18. So, uh, so Naaman's cured. Uh, he comes back to Elisha. And here are the three marks of someone who actually encountered the living God. Uh, number one, the first mark, he has a change in his thinking. So look at 2 Kings 5, 15. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God, back to Elisha, stood before him and said, now I know. There's no God in all the world except in Israel. Now I know there's no God of the whole universe except the God of Israel. Now, if Naaman had come back and said, now I know that your God is more powerful than my God, that would not have meant a change in his worldview, uh, his mental map of reality. Uh, because at the time, everyone in the world was a pluralist, except, of course, Israel. Outside of Israel, everyone believed there were many gods, Every nation, every city, every region had their own local gods. The world was polytheistic and pluralistic. And it was okay for you to have your gods and for me to have mine. And when I went to visit your city, I'd pay homage to your local gods. No problem. So for Naaman to come back and not to say, your God is better than my God, or your God's more powerful than my God, but that he's the only God, this is a complete paradigm shift. Naaman realizes his cure isn't just a miracle, but it's a whole new way of thinking about life uh, and human nature uh, and who God is. So he comes back and he says, there are no other gods except the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. There's only one God. And if you go even today to a super pluralistic city like New York or London, that statement will be just as outrageous today as it was back then. But here's the first point. An encounter with the Lord is both an emotional, mystical, spiritual experience and also an intellectual, rational revolution in your thinking as well. Why? Because we are holistic beings. We need our heart changed. But our heart won't change until our mind changes as well. Now, the heart, biblically, is, is the seat of your will. Uh, it determines what you trust in, what you hope in, uh, what you live for. That's what sets the course of your thinking and your feelings and, and behavior. And you can't have a heart change unless you first change what you're trusting in. And that means thinking and understanding new truths. Saying, I was trusting in this, but now I need to trust in that instead. So if you're going to meet God like Naaman did, your mind has to change. So the marks of someone who's met God within include, number one, uh, your mind, uh, your beliefs change. Number two, you have a whole new attitude towards your possessions. Notice the second thing that Naaman says after he acknowledges the, the one true God. Look at 2 Kings 5.15. He says, so please accept a gift from your servant. Now remember, 
Naaman had come to Israel uh, with 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 sets of clothing. And in today's currency, there would be an enormous amount, uh, at least millions, if not more, in today's money. And he was ready to give it all away for his cure. But now he gets the cure for free, right? It's free. He didn't have to pay a penny for it. And now he comes back and he says, please accept this gift. So why would he want to part with his money now? He already got what he came for. And the answer is, he's not giving this money to get anything. He's giving this money out of gratitude and joy out of thanksgiving to God, out of the abundance of his heart, period. And they overhead, one of the marks of a person who's experienced the grace of God is a radical increase in your generosity. You want to, you want to know why? Let's be honest about our money. It's not just money, right? It's self-esteem currency. Your money determines how you feel about yourself. It determines whether you feel accomplished, whether you feel you've made it in life. It's your security, it's your self-worth. And that's why it's so hard to give it away to others, to donate to the needy, or even to tithe. We don't want to compromise the lifestyle we've grown accustomed to on the overhead. But when God and his grace becomes your self-worth, becomes your security, becomes your value, then money, it's just money. It's just money. And therefore, it's much easier to be generous and to give tithes and offerings. Has that happened to you? And note also that Naaman says this, 2 Kings 5.15. So please accept this gift from your servant. Now, Naaman is the top general in all of Syria. People jump at his command. So to call himself a servant of the prophet of Israel that indicates a real heart change. Here was a man who, outside of his king, everybody served him. He was at the top of the food chain. So for him to say to Elisha, I'm your servant, shows a fundamental change. On the overhead, the central operating principle of Satan is to say to his followers, your life for mine. You sacrifice for me. Your life to benefit and increase mine. On the overhead, the central operating principle of Yeshua is the exact opposite. He says, my life for yours. I lay down my life for you. My life to benefit and increase yours. My life poured out for you. On the overhead. Now, every day, even in the smallest interactions, you are either on the Satan path or the Yeshua path. You're either becoming more and more like Satan or more and more like Yeshua. So here's a simple example. Let's say you're eating lunch at Oneg uh, here at the shul, once we have lunch again, hopefully in a few weeks. And you, you look around and you see, uh, you're try, try, trying to see who you're going to sit next to. And you say, wow, that person over there, he could potentially open some doors for me. That's an important, prestigious person. And over there is someone who you think to yourself, uh, I'll get nothing out of him. Uh, and therefore, you go and sit with the first person and not the second. That's an example of being on the Satan path. Right there. Even in the smallest decision. But an encounter with the Lord puts you on the Yeshua path. It makes you realize that everything you have is a gift of grace. And suddenly... You feel rich. And now you know it's really important, eternally important, is already assured to you. And you start to say to Yeshua, my life for yours. So the marks of a true life-changing encounter with God are what we see, that we see in Naaman here in this passage are number one, revolutionary new biblical beliefs. Number two, radical generosity. And number three, God becomes central to your life. Every part of your life. Look what Naaman says to Elisha, 2 Kings 5, uh, 5 17 to 19. Please let me, your servant, be, be given now as much earth 
as a pair of mules can carry, for your, your servant will never again make burnt offerings. Sorry about that. Make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. May the, may my, uh, may, uh, but may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Ramon to bow down, he's leaning on my arm, and I have to bow down also. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha says. Now, what's going on here? First, notice what Naaman does, does not say. He doesn't say, oh, Elisha, can I please stay here with you? Uh, I don't want to go back to all those filthy pagans. I just want to hang out with the good, pure people. I want nothing to do with those dirty heathen anymore. Does he do that? No. He goes right back into his life. Yeah, his, and his life in Syria, in, the, in his life in Syria, he's probably the equivalent of being like the prime minister, just under the king. Because the, because the temple of Ramon was the central temple of the main god of Syria at the time. And the god Ramon was seen as sort of a deification of the nation, uh, uh, an extension of the nation. So, so all the great ceremonies of state happened there. And the king would go in and sit in state in the temple. And whoever was the one privileged with uh, escorting him into the temple would have been his prime minister, uh, his second in command. So here's Naaman saying, I'm going back. I'm going back to my job. Uh, so he's not withdrawing from the world. He's not saying, I want nothing to do with these wicked pagans. I want to stay and live with Elisha or go to some monastery or, or, or to some commune. No. But he's also not saying, when I go back, I'll just keep my faith private. Religion, that should be kept private. Uh, it's just to give you your own inner peace and contentment. It's not for one's public life. No, he's not saying that at all. Because he's purposely doing a very public act. He's doing something that would have been recognizable to all those around him. He's saying, I'm going to let the whole world know that even though I've come back to Syria, I worship the God of Israel. I'm going to sh be showing everyone that because of this, because every time I kneel down, I'm going to first be putting some of this dirt from Israel uh, uh, down below me when I kneel, by which I'll be declaring that I'm kneeling down to the God of Israel. And if you read the commentators, all the commentators say this is what everyone would have realized and understood what this act meant. And therefore, what Naaman is saying is, when I go into the temple, into the ceremony of state, uh, these, 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 these special public events, I'm going to be letting everybody know that even though I love my country, I do not worship their gods. I worship only one true God, the God of Israel. So Naaman, he goes back into his secular life, his secular job, but, he's do, but, but in doing so, he's now publicly identifying as a believer in the Lord. And as a believer... The Lord now becomes central to every part of his life. Nothing is walled off. Nothing is exempt. And when Naaman asks Elijah uh, if he's doing it right, Elijah says, yeah, that works. Go in peace. So Naaman does not withdraw from the world or his secular job or his responsibilities, no. He goes back into the very center of it. But he's going now to be salt and light there. He's going to have God at the center of his life and publicly live for the Lord in every aspect of his life. You know, when I became a believer back in college, I was involved in various campus ministries. And we were sort of living in a bubble there on campus. And so one of the challenges was always when we went back home for the summer. How would we continue in our faith uh, back home? And many students fell into one of these two extremes. Some of the students went back fanatical uh, and belligerent. <laughs> I'm born again, why aren't you? you know, I'm not, you're not a true believer. Look at all those sins you're doing. Uh, all those sins that I used to do, of course, but, but I no longer do. So turn or burn. <laughs> and these people were offensive uh, and obnoxious and completely ineffective in positive, positively influencing anyone. But then some students went to the other extreme. They hid their faith at home. They would not go to church or Messianic synagogue at home. They only went to public worship services on the college campus. They said, 
Well, if I get up on Sunday morning to go to church, if I get up on Saturday morning to go to Messianic synagogue, my family's going to say, what's wrong with you? Have you become kind of, some kind of religious fanatic? And I don't want that kind of attack or criticism, so I'm going to keep my faith to myself at home. I will keep it private and secret. And both extremes are wrong. What Naaman is saying is that the gospel radically transforms you. It humbles you because you know you're just a sinner saved by God's grace. And so therefore you don't condemn or look down your nose at anybody else like in the first student example. And at the same time, the gospel gives you courage. So you don't care what other people think about you. And you're not going to hide your faith on your light under a bushel uh, as in the second student example. And when you combine this humility with this courage, you get a beautiful gospel balance. You publicly identify and live as a Yeshua follower in every area of your life. But at the same time, you're not being belligerent or, or offensive or obnoxious to others. You'll go back into the various aspects of your life, but like Naaman, you now have the Lord at the center of your life. And Elisha says to Naaman, go in peace. So let me ask you, do you have this gospel balance? Are you living it at home and at work and at school and at the gym uh, and everywhere you go? And, and don't you see, if you have really met the Lord, if you really know Yeshua, you cannot keep him private. You can't relegate him to just certain parts of your life. He must be at the center of every aspect of your life. And so these are three marks of someone who's really met the living God that we see here with Naaman. But the story doesn't end there, does it? And in the rest of the chapter, we see a contrast in what it means to have, have an encounter with God versus what it means to look religious on the outside but not know the Lord. So let's now look at Gehazi. Gehazi was Elisha's servant, probably his apprentice. Uh, as, and, and as we saw, Elisha refuses to take a gift from Naaman, right? So look at 2 Kings 5.16. The prophet Elisha answered, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing from you. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. Now, by the way, it's not wrong for a minister to receive a gift for their ministry. But notice what Elisha says at the end of the story when he's rep reprimanding uh, Gehazi. Look at uh, verse 26. He got, Elisha says, is this the time to take money or accept clothes or olive groves and vineyards or flocks and herds or male and female slaves? Is this the time? Now, what's happening here is that a major figure from another country comes to the prophet of Israel, and he gets it. He sees the truth of who God is. He experiences the grace of God. This is astonishing. And now he's going back to Syria and will bear witness to that. And because Elisha is trying to communicate to Naaman the truth of the gospel, that salvation is purely by free grace, he wants nothing to muddy those waters. Nothing. It's got to be totally clear to Naaman and totally clear to everyone else who's looking at this. You cannot buy the salvation of God. Now, now Naaman's offer was an enormous amount of money. Probably would have, would have made Elisha the richest person in Israel. He was walking away from more money than you and I would ever make in a lifetime. More money than he ever imagined. But Elisha had no problem walking away from it all. Because he says, I am first and foremost a preacher of the word of God. My job is to preach the gospel. And in order to effectively do that, I need to walk away from this money. But Gehazi does not have these scruples. So Gehazi goes after Naaman to extract some of this money from him. And by the way, Gehazi is very smart in how he goes about doing it. He tells a lie, but it's a good lie. Because he doesn't say, I want this money from me, which would have arose suspicion. And he also doesn't say, I want it from my master Elisha. My master's changed his mind, which would, have, would not have been credible. Nor does he ask for all of it, but only for part. These impoverished yeshiva students, these young prophets in training from up in the hill country. So Gehazi, he's very crafty. Uh, and he gets the money, uh, and he brings it back. But Elisha knows and judges him. And most of all, God judges him. 
he becomes the leper that Naaman was. Now, how does Gehazi bring, bring himself to do this evil deed? Look at, uh, first, first it says this, 2 Kings 5, verse 20. My master, was, he was too easy on Naaman, this Arab man, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I'll run after him and get something from him. So first, note that uh, Gehazi notes that Naaman is an Aramean, a Syrian. He brings up his race. He calls him this Aramean. He looks out at his nose at him because of his race. And in his mind, this gives him a warrant to exploit him and get whatever he can from him. So here's the first contrast. Everything, everything that God does to bring Naaman to himself humbles him. Naaman, even to get to Israel, uh, had to overcome his prejudice against people from another race. And to get his healing, Naaman also had to overcome his prejudice against people of another faith. And everything that God allows to happen to Naaman was to get rid of his self-righteousness, get rid of his pride, bring him down, humble him. And yet now here's Gehazi. He's looking down on others. He's self-righteous. He's imperious. Uh, he's incredibly proud. He's filled with religious and spiritual pride. And that leads to the other contrast with Naaman. Naaman is a pagan, right? Naaman knows nothing about the Bible. But, but, but Gehazi was a very religious person. He knew the Bible backwards and forwards, inside and out. He heard the word of God proclaimed all the time. He sat at the feet of one of the greatest prophets of Israel. And yet what happened? He's on the Satan path. He's on the path of Satan. He's on the Satan path because see, he says this. He says, how can I use this person? How can I exploit this person? Here's a religious man who's on the Satan path, not the Yeshua path. And this shows us, put this in the overhead, this shows us that the grace of God makes you a better person, but religion without the grace of God, can make you a worse person than if you had no religion at all. And that's the main point of the second half of this chapter. Now, people ask, is God making Gehazi a leper going too far? You know, is that going overboard? No, not at all. Let me explain. You know, there's lots of things wrong with this world, right? There's lots of people walking around with incredibly ugly souls. They're cruel. They're shallow. They're nasty people. They have incredibly ugly souls, but unbelievably beautiful, healthy bodies. A lot of people like that. On the other hand, it, it's just as bent and broken to realize there are many beautiful souls, gorgeous, loving souls, inside people who have broken, disfigured, or unattractive bodies. So the world has a lot of ugly souls with beautiful, healthy bodies, and a lot of beautiful souls with ugly and diseased bodies. Not fair, is it? And if God were to put it right, then every person with an ugly soul would also, on the outside, be visible to the world who they really are on the inside. Like in Oscar Wilde's famous work, uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray, uh, where the main character uh, becomes uglier and uglier within, and as he does that, his picture, his portrait, would change and portray his hideousness on the outside. And likewise, if God were to put all things right, everyone with a beautiful soul would also be beautiful on the outside, showing the world who they really are. And so do, uh, and so do you know what God is doing here with Gehazi? In a small way, he's putting the world right. In this particular instance, he's belling the cat, if you will. He's showing the world what's on the inside of this man so, now, so that, that now they can see it on the outside. So is God being unfair? No, not at all. But, but at least in this one place, he's making the world right and warning us as well and reminding us that one day, all the ugly will be ugly, and all the beautiful will be beautiful. One day, Messiah will put the world right. So here we have this very religious person, Gehazi, 
He's at shul every week. He, has the, he gets the perfect attendance pin. He knows the Bible inside and out. He gets an A in the Bible class. He can read Hebrew and Greek. He keeps Shabbat strictly. He keeps perfect kosher. Every week he wears a kippah and a talit. And yet he's missed God. He's utterly missed God. He's all the things that Naaman's not. He has none of the signs of a heart that's encountered the Lord. Gehazi misses God. Naaman meets God. And so finally, how can you be sure that you will not miss God? Let's look at the third key figure in this narrative. The little Jewish slave girl. She's only mentioned at the beginning of the story. 2 Kings 5, verses 2 and 3. Now, bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet in Samaria, he'd cure him of his leprosy. Now, first of all, this captive is called a young girl. The actual Hebrew word used here implies a pre-adolescent, probably ages 10 to 12. She's been taken captive. Now she's a slave in Naaman's house. And if you know anything about the brutality of warfare, especially at that time, we're, we're told bands of raiders from Syria had invaded Israel and taken her captive, she is likely to have seen her parents killed before her eyes. And if she had any surviving siblings, they would have been just sold off in various places. And now she's a slave for life in this Syrian household. She's at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the pecking order. She's a slave, she's a girl, she's of the wrong race, she's of the wrong religion. She has no money, no rights, no status. She's at the bottom of the social order. She has a dead-end future. Everything has been taken away from her. Her whole life's been ruined. And who above everybody is responsible for this? The supreme military commander of the army of Syria, Naaman. So this dead-end life she has is all his fault. Just now imagine her at night, lying on her little cot in the, in the slave quarters, and thinking of her long-lost family, thinking of the life that she once had that will never come back, thinking of the horrible life she now has, and the misery that she's in. She's in the very house of the man who's responsible for it all. So how does she respond to all of this? And this is the key to the whole story. Let's first look at how she did not respond. When she heard that he, he had leprosy, that Naaman had leprosy, she did not say this. Ha! The big man has leprosy. Serves him right. Punishment from God. Another finger fell off today. Yes! <laughs> Payback is sweet. And I know how he can be saved. That's the last thing I'm going to tell him. At least I'll get some satisfaction knowing that I had his life in my hands and I let him die. And I will dance on his grave. Is that what she said? No. In fact, she says the opposite. She wants to see him healed. 2 Kings 5, verse 3, she says, If only my master would see the prophet... He's in Samaria. Uh, he, he, he would cure him of his leprosy. She cries out of only my master. That's an expression of kindness and desire. There's love there. There's compassion for Naaman. How can this be? And the answer is, it must have been costly forgiveness. Well, David, what do you mean costly forgiveness? Well, well all forgiveness is costly, some a lot more than others. So, for example, you give me $5, I lose it, I ask you for another $5, it's not a big deal for you to give it to me. Forgive me about losing the first five. But what if I borrow your car and I crash it, uh, and your insurance won't cover it, and I ask you to forgive me, that's a lot harder. <laughs> but how much harder would this be, with this little Jewish slave girl faced? Her choice is to either absorb all her suffering, and pay the price, and forgive him, so that he lives, he's cured, or she can choose not to forgive him, 
and pay him back and give him some suffering, not tell him about the cure, and he eventually dies. So his life is in her hands. She can forgive him and bear the suffering, and he lives. Well, she can refuse to forgive him and make him suffer and pay for his own sins, and he dies. But she chooses to forgive. She bears her suffering. She changes her heart. She expresses love and compassion for him. She pays the price of kingdom usefulness. You know, if when you're wronged, you refuse to forgive, it might be satisfying in the short run to stay angry and to have revenge fantasies against the person, maybe even pay them back directly. But it will turn you into a cold, hard person. You have given yourself over to the dark side. And then you're not useful to anybody. But because she paid the price of kingdom usefulness, because she forgave him at tremendous cost to herself, because she bore her suffering quietly, faithfully, because she did not become bitter or bear a grudge. She turned herself into someone who's incredibly useful, not only for Naaman, but for God's kingdom. She became a compassionate person, an empathetic person, a tender-hearted person, a wise person. She became a person who was able to bring this enormous blessing to Naaman and his family. And that's why he was saved, both physically from his leprosy and spiritually from his paganism. How was he saved? He had a suffering servant, a suffering servant in his life. He had a servant that although he robbed her, she forgave him. She bore the cost, she suffered. And then he believed her word, and he was saved. That's why he met God. And you have a suffering servant available to you as well. The ultimate suffering servant. The one to whom this little girl points. Yeshua the Messiah. He also was separated from his father. He came to earth in exile, if you will, from his heavenly house. And the pain of his separation was infinitely more than anything she experienced or anything anyone would ever experience. And when he came to earth, what did we do to him? We beat him, mocked him, scourged him, whipped him, spat on him, rejected him. And as he was dying, as we were killing him, he looked down from the cross upon the human race, and he stays. He stays. And he cries out in Luke 23 and 34, Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And he bears the punishment that, that you and I deserve. Because he didn't uh, uh, pay us back. He had our life in his hands, but because he bears it, he, he forgives, we can be saved if we turn from our sin and we turn from ourself and we turn to him. And that's how you encounter God. So why are you suffering in any way right now? Maybe a sickness uh, or financial setback or a marital or other relational breakdown. Has someone wronged you and you're angry? Pay the price of kingdom usefulness. Forgive. Do not hold a grudge. Do not become bitter, either against the person or against God. If you want to make your, 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 your heart soft, like this little girl did, if you want to become compassionate and kind uh, and empathetic and wise and useful, pay the price by forgiving others. Don't just look at her as an example. Look at her as pointing to the one who's not just your example, but your Lord and your Savior and your Redeemer and Rescuer and Bridegroom God. Yeshua is the ultimate suffering servant. Trust in him today. Embrace him, worship him, live for him, love him, and he will turn you inside into something beautiful. And eventually, it'll be on the outside too. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Hallelujah. I'd like the music team to come on up. Now, all you at home, please stand up and stand and pray with us. Thank you. Father, we thank you today for this uh, second half of the story of Naaman uh, and all that it teaches us. 
Naaman, he had leprosy on the outside, but his real problem was from within. His pride, his paganism, his reliance on self-effort. And likewise, Lord, today we acknowledge our real problems are inside of us. Our sin, our pride, our judgmentalism, our anger, our lust, our deceit, our selfish ambition, our greed, our jealousy, our unbelief. And our only solution comes from without, comes from you, Lord Yeshua. And not from outward religion or rituals or commandment keeping, but only from your grace, your free, unmerited grace. Uh, indeed, we say that the religious man, Gehazi, he misses you, uh, the one who finally uh, agrees to come to you with nothing in his hands, Naaman, he's the one who meets you. Because all we need is need. All we need is nothing. But do we have it? And so, Lord, help us also, in addition, Lord, like Naaman, uh, to be radically generous with our resources, the resources that you bless us with. Help us get our self-worth and our identity and our security from you, Yeshua, and not from our money. Help us to be generous with our tithes and offerings and not to rob you. Help us to give the joy and gratitude for all you've done for us. Uh, and help, help each one of us, Lord, in every area of our life, uh, with my work, my school, uh, uh, my athletics, my home, my marriage, my relationships, my entertainment, my speech, my thought life. In every area, Lord, to say, my life for you. I want my whole life to be poured out as a sacrificial offering to you, Lord Yeshua. I pray this all in your name, Hashem Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat Shalom.